All right, so let's talk about cryotherapy or the use of cold. All right, so this can range from using ice, cold pack, chemical pack, just running cold water over an injury, a thing called cryokinetics, cryo stretch, which we'll cover in lab, cold water baths, ice massage. Okay, uh, so those are the sorts of things that we'll be using uh, in our clinics. Two different types of techniques that we can discuss. One is being immediate care, so uh, uh, cooling the, the, the tissue immediately after your injury. As physical therapists, unfortunately, we're not going to be seeing a whole lot of this. Uh, uh, yeah, athletic trainers in our crowd, yep, you're going to be doing that, doing that quite a bit. Um, uh, but we're going to be more in the post-immediate care, so, you know, 48, 72 hours, two weeks later, Okay, things like that. Okay, so uh, we're going to be looking at the effects for both of these. Uh, the effects are probably, I don't know, better for immediate care uh, and probably poorly used or misunderstood for uh, the post-immediate care uh, that, that we tend to, tend to use. Uh, but ice is good. I like ice. Okay, so we can use it in a lot of different ways. We can use a bag of ice. That should be your method of choice. If you have any choice on buying things in your clinic, get an ice machine. Um, uh, and we'll talk about that as we as we go along and when we go to lab. Uh, of course, the standby ice cups. Uh, we're we're going to play around with the vapor coolant sprays, so a little spray and stretch. Uh, the uh, chemical packs, uh, the type of uh, uh, things that you know come in a first aid kit. Uh, not not really good for anything that we do. Uh, but they're out there. And of course, your cold compression units, um, uh, you know, game ready and uh, just cryo cuff, which we're going to use in our labs. Okay, so those are the different types of agents. And of course, just tank, you know, or, or tubs, you know, immersion sorts of things. So, what kind of effects are we going to get? Of course, we're going to be able to decrease uh, temperature. Uh, we can cause frostbite, so we can destroy tissue as well. Um, uh, you know, typical. Uh, uh, physiological effect that you know we think we're doing this for is for decreasing inflammation uh, but uh, you know you would think uh, out of something that's uh, cold being so benign that everyone uses that we would fully understand it it's uh, one of those things that we don't fully understand the uh, all, all the effects but what we what we can do with it we can decrease metabolism so we can decrease the actions of the, the cells in the area we can decrease pain, okay? We can decrease muscle spasm. We can increase tissue stiffness. Um, so there are a lot of things that, you know, that we, you know, the physiological effects. And, and really, these are the things that you need to be aware of with any modality that we're going to be talking about this semester are, uh, you know, what are the physiological effects? Because that's how you know what to, how to apply it and when to apply it, right? And then the last two things down there, decreased uh, arthrogenic inhibition and decreased circulation. And so we're going to look at that arthrogenic inhibition via a stretch uh, technique when we get to lab. Um, uh, and, uh, of course, decreased circulation, which I already said. Okay, so metabolic effects. All right, so the thing to keep in mind is once we put ice on, we're decreasing the rate of anything that's underneath that ice of all metabolic reactions. Okay, so if we're, you know, early in that inflammatory stage and we want to have inflammation, uh, uh, we're going to be decreasing that. Okay, so, uh, you know, inflammatory is, uh, you know, inflammation is, an, is a normal response. Uh, and so, uh, you know, usually the, as soon as someone comes in, as we say, we want to decrease that inflammation. Well, you got to think, is, do you want to decrease that inflammation, right? Is there some something there that um, is going on that shouldn't be, or is that, you know, normal inflammation? So, uh, you know, be careful with that and make, make you know, good decisions on on, uh, on your treatment of you know, something that's inflamed. Okay, so uh, uh, cold can also inhibit cartilage-degrading enzymes. Okay, so it can be very useful for OA and RA. So um, uh, might be might be a good uh, thing to consider. For your OA patients. Okay, so that's the decreased metabolic effect. Same sort of chart that we saw for uh, for increasing temperature, um, and you can follow through. But you know, the bottom line here is you know getting down here to the bottom 
is uh, decreasing uh, blood flow. Uh, but when we decrease temperature, we hit those cutaneous thermoreceptors, go through either smooth muscle or the spinal cord, uh, we get vasoconstriction, and we also increase sympathetic activation, and so uh, we get uh, decreased blood flow through those mechanisms. We also decrease our vasodilators, vasoconstriction, blood flow. Okay, we also increase our blood viscosity at those lower temperatures, so we also decrease blood flow. Okay, so those are he hemodynamic or blood effects. Okay, so you'll also read about a thing called co co cold induced vasodilation. Okay, so, um, uh, and we'll talk about more about that in uh, coming up slides right here. Uh, we already talked about uh, viscosity, and uh, uh, so let's talk about that um, cold induced vasodilation and or the hunting response. Okay, so back in 1930, uh, this guy, Lewis, did an experiment where uh, they, they um, demonstrated a cycling of vasoconstriction vasodilation uh, when someone was iced. And so, uh, and, and unfortunately, it, it still persists uh, a lot today. I mean, you, you may hear this in your clinic or hear from another therapist that, uh, uh, you know, if we, as we get, um, as we put cold on, we put a cold on for some period of time, and that, that we're going to get vasodilation after that uh, as the body responds to the cold, and then vasodilates to try and protect it. And, and that's basically what these guys reported way back in the 1930s, and that's persisted uh, uh, until, you know, today. People still believe this happens, okay? Um, kind of the bottom line, to skip to the point, is that um, uh, it, it happens, but on such a small amount that um, it's it kind of inconsequential. So uh, we'll talk about that as we go along. But, um, uh, you know, people try to repeat, repeat this experiment for years and years and years and, and uh, weren't able to do it. In 1997, uh, Danon uh, uh, thought that uh, hunting response would be determined by core body temperature um, and that the cooler of the core decreased the magnitude of the hunting response. Um, and then uh, many others who looked at it saw a decreased blood flow within a gradual and uneven increase in blood flow uh, only about 50% of the baseline. So uh, back and forth on the research over the years. Um, but the bottom line is the bottom, the, the, the last bullet point right down there, just saying that the hunting response is largely insignificant, lost within measurement errors. And that's probably what the consensus is today. So uh, definitely should not be using your uh, you know, cold therapies to to think that you're going to induce more uh, vasodilation and more blood flow to an area, okay? Just probably doesn't happen. So anyway, enough said on that. Okay, so we can also decrease pain with ice. It's probably one of the most beneficial things, okay? It, it acts as a counter irritant. So as we get cold, we don't think so much about the, the uh, irritation of the pain. We're able to reduce muscle spasm, uh, re de decreases um, nerve conduction velocity. Um, can possibly decrease edema. We'll talk about that as we as as we go along right here, um, and uh, we may have increased uh, uh, pain with it though too, because some people experience uh, a, a cold pain, you know, achiness. Uh, uh, most of us are able to tolerate, it, but for some it is in, intolerable. Okay, so uh, we're able to decrease uh, spasticity. Okay, this works quite nicely on some of your neuro patients and uh, a, a light application of ice for 15 or 20 minutes okay, has been shown to decrease the muscle stretch reflex and frequency of clonus. So it can be uh, somewhat effective um, when you're trying to decrease some spasticity for short periods of time and uh, allow your patients to participate a little more fully. Okay, so uh, people aren't quite clear on why that is. A couple of reasons listed there in that we may be affecting the gamma motor neuron activity um, as well as uh, may, it may decrease discharges at the spindle. Okay, so heat versus cold, when and why? Okay, this is going to be the number one question you'll ever get for the rest of your life. Uh, doc, do I use heat or cold? You know, which do you, which, which you're going to use? All right, so, all right, so, uh, very good for immediate care of acute injuries, okay? So positive is we decrease metabolism, we decrease blood flow, we decrease uh, pain, okay? So we also um, uh, decrease muscle spasm, okay? So 
works works pretty well for that. Okay, in subacute, okay, uh, that decrease in circulation, metabolism, inflammation may not be what we're looking for, right? So uh, you know, be careful of that 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 use of ice. In a lot of you know, a lot of our guys are going to be these guys, the subacute guys, right? So uh, you know, uh, make sure you've got a physiological effect that you want to have when you're using that ice. Decreasing pain is probably a real good reason, okay? So, uh, but you have to balance it against um, the healing mechanisms that are also taking place. So, so of course, you got to be careful with that. Okay. So, and one of the things we'll talk about when we get to lab is cryokinetics. That's uh, basically, you know, really icing somebody up and then having them do exercise. Uh, and uh, some very, very nice studies uh, with folks that are that are using that uh, for for benefits. You know, post ankle sprain. Uh, and things like that. So, um, uh, and there's a pretty, uh, pretty good go by in your lab manual for that. Okay, so cold also decreases a thing that's called secondary hypoxic injury, which is a uh, 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 term that was coined by uh, uh, this uh, researcher Knight. I think he's out of, in. Um, uh, oh gosh, Salt Lake City. Uh, whatever's there, can't remember. Anyway, somewhere out there, Brigham Young, that's what I'm looking for, okay, BYU. Uh, and anyway, so describes the tissue damage um, uh, that, that happens when uh, uh, we have a metabolic imbalance from that acute injury, okay? So basically what's happening is, is the, you know, the dead cells are drowning the good cells, and so uh, we get a hypoxic reaction as, um, uh, uh, as all the exudate from the wound uh, makes its way into the uh, tissues that it's choking out the uh, non-injured cells. And so uh, he termed this secondary hypoxic injury in that um, after an acute injury, if we don't control uh, some of that, that, um, that we, you know, we in incur further injury. So that's one of the thoughts that we get, uh, the benefits that we get out of the cold. Okay, so... Um, Inflammation control is something we get because it is definitely slowing things down. So if that's something you want, it's a good thing to use. Uh, and uh, we're also decreasing the blood flow. Okay, so uh, uh, slowing down the, the the movement of fluid to interstitials uh, tissues. So when do we apply it? Immediately after injury. Okay, and maybe acute inflammatory. So just in the first few hours, first couple days uh, post injury. Okay, and then. After that, and I have on the bullet there, stop applying when acute inflammation is resolved. That's kind of a it depends sort of a bullet. Uh, it depends on what the, the effect you're looking for. Okay, so if you're still looking to get some good pain relief, it's a good thing to use. But you need to uh, make sure you take into account that we, we do want some inflammation to be to be happening uh, for uh, injury recovery. Okay, so edema control. So I said there's kind of a, a, a caveat to that. Okay, so. Um, the way we're going to use coal to to um, uh, uh, help with our edema is by getting it on early and stopping the fluid going into the interstitium. Okay, so once that happens, okay, once you have edema present, cold is going to do nothing to move that back uh, back in. Okay, so you're gonna th there you're gonna need to be applying uh, uh, pressure. So um, uh, in order to get that back or muscle pump. Okay, to get that uh, edema out um, uh, of of the uh, interstitial spaces. Okay, so uh, you know your patient's coming up. And you're saying we're going to put this on to control edema. Ain't going to happen. Okay, so that happened in the first uh, few minutes to hours of that injury, and uh, cold can do a very good job of limiting that, but it's not going to change it once it's there. Okay, so uh, there we have the person that comes in that, uh, you know, has edema, and are we going to use them uh, uh, when for immobility and poor circulation? The answer is no. Okay, so our standard rest ice compression elevation uh, equation. Okay, so studies using ice generally show no reduction in inflammation or edema using ice alone. So what that's telling us is that the other components of this, especially our compression elevation, are more key uh, uh, in that post-injury phase uh, than just using ice. Okay, so uh, we've got to use all these things in in combination. Um, uh, typically, we rely 
probably too much on, on one part of that, uh, 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 that equation in order to try and get to the solution. So bottom line, ice usually not so effective. We want to be getting that on as soon as possible um, after trauma. Okay, so we get pain control with it. Okay, so short applications of ice uh, can give upwards of one to two hours of pain control. And that's thought to blocking the conduction of the A-delta fibers and gating pain transmission. Okay, so we get that prolonged effect because of the, uh, the, the time it takes for those tissues uh, to warm up. And uh, so we're able to break into that uh, pain spasm cycle. Okay, uh, and we might be able to uh, reduce inflammation uh, if, if inflammation is out of control in that particular patient. Okay, we talked just a second ago about specificity mod modification. Uh, and so uh, we can definitely make changes with, with that for short periods of time. And you might get an effect that can last an hour. So you're able to uh, apply that and uh, uh, be, have more effective uh, exercise or um, you know, treatment sessions for your, for your patient if you're able to modify that spasticity to some, some extent. Okay, so let's talk about uh, application then. So dosing of this. So uh, one of the key parts to, uh, to dosing is going to be your temperature gradient. And we talked about that with uh, your rates of heat transfer. How much area we have, so you know how how much ice, how big your cold packs are going to be, and how long that you're going to be putting it on. So usually we're looking at 20 to 30 minutes <coughs> for your basic icing, and ice massage is going to be in the vicinity of about five minutes. So a few contraindications. Again, this is a list you just need to know, need to memorize. Okay, so first one is called code cold urticaria or a cold allergy. And uh, you know someone here in class may may have this, and you may know that you uh, you know develop welts and have problems when you're exposed to to cold. Not to be con confused with Raynaud's disease, where you have uh, shutting down of some of the microvasculature, um, and that's definitely going to be experienced by uh, you know some of the some some of you folks here in class. Okay, so it's women more than men, um, and uh, you know that's where those fingertips turn. Uh, turn white out on these cold days, and uh, uh, as the as the vasculature uh, shuts down. So, uh, extreme cases, um, uh, it can be dangerous. So, it's something to to make sure you're you're asking your patients if they got a problem with that as you start to to uh, uh, freeze them with your cold packs. Okay, so uh, I'm probably butchering the pronunciation of this one, cryoglobulinemia. Um, and basically, um, it's a disorder that when we apply cold, uh, we're turning the blood to gel. Okay, so you've got a blood protein that forms a gel, and of course, we don't want gel in our, our vessels. So um, uh, that can be a problem. <clears throat> I've never seen this. Uh, uh, but as, as I said, listed as a contra, and uh, you know, most likely someone's going to know that they have this before you uh, throw an ice pack on them. Uh, you want to be very careful over regenerating peripheral nerve. So you know, even someone with a, you know, you got to think about a, a you know, carpal tunnel, uh, a, you know, problem at the elbow, you know, places where the nerves can be very superficial. So you know, be be careful with that. Um, Okay, areas, uh, contraindication would be an area with circulatory compromise, so you don't cause uh, tissue depth, d death. Uh, and then some people just don't tolerate cold, okay? So, um, and again, someone is probably going to tell you they don't, they, they're not going to like it, but you, that's what you're going to have to investigate. So precautions, okay? Over superficial nerve, again, the wrist, the elbow, the knee, okay? Places where we know that, uh, that you know, the nerves are somewhat exposed. Open wounds, uh, some with hypertension, very old, very young, uh, maybe not, uh, they, they can be more susceptible to the cold or also may not uh, say something to you that they're, that they're experiencing uh, cold. Um, and then, uh, again, impaired uh, mentation, okay, or able to distinguish um, or discriminate, uh, you know, heat and cold. So, you know, problems with being able to tell you whether uh, uh, there's, there's an issue going on. So... Biggest adverse effect, of course, is frostbite, okay? So we have tissue depth, death when that occurs, uh, and we can also cause nerve damage. So uh, typically, though, since we have very shallow depth of penetration from our cold, uh, you know, the, the ones we have to be worried about are the, the superficial nerves, okay? So um, hopefully you recall that 
from anatomy, you know where things are. So uh, you know when you're putting a, a cold pack over the top of a, a fairly superficial nerve. Okay, cold packs, packs come in a lot of flavors, okay? And we're typically putting them in a freezer at, uh, uh, at about zero degrees centigrade, okay? Or 32 degrees, just below freezing. Um, and so as we use those things, uh, what we're going to do is, um, uh, you know, as they're coming in and out of the cooler, you definitely want to uh, make sure you've got some sort of rotation schedule with your uh, cold packs. So, so the same one's not being reused over and over and over again. You need to uh, allow sufficient time for those to uh, uh, cool back down again. All right, so typical treatment time is going to be in the 10 to 30 minute range. We can definitely extend that using uh, if we're using uh, uh, crushed ice, and we'll talk about that as we as we go to lab. Okay, but let's talk about some differences, though, in an ice pack and a cold pack. And by a cold pack, the ones that are listed here uh, in, the, in the pictures. Okay, so as we talked about, ice has a pretty high specific heat, so it's able to... Uh, uh, retain but also uh, give out more energy especially since there's a phase change involved as it melts okay so um, uh, it's it's a bit more aggressive cooling right but the good thing about ice is it's right at the freezing temperature okay so it's you know when we're looking at uh, you know crushed ice from a um, from your ice machine you know the ice that we kind of prefer in our drinks is the kind of slushy uh, uh, not all, you know, just just ice, uh, sort of ice. You know that's why that when you go to McDonald's, you've got kind of a slushy ice, not the big cubes like you get out of your refrigerator at home. Okay, so um, th and those machines are made to just keep the ice just uh, below the freezing point or right at the freezing point. Okay, and uh, that's the kind of ice we really should be applying uh, in our clinics. Now the reason for that is that these uh, ice packs like we see right here, they're going to take on the temperature of the um, uh, of your machine. And a lot of people are using regular uh, uh, freezers in their clinics. That's a mistake, okay, because a regular freezer uh, is much colder than a freezer that's made to use uh, in a clinic, all right? And we're going to look at an article. You know, I've uh, got an instruction there on Blackboard for you to pull up an article looking at the differences in four different cooling methods uh, and and we're also going to play around with that a little bit in lab with our, our thermometers. Okay, so another type of cold pack that's uh, you know commonly prescribed in our clinic is using a homemade pack of water and rubbing alcohol. And another one would be just you know people will say hey go home and use you know a bag of peas you know something that's convenient. So here's a chart from that article that I just uh, referenced, and this one you definitely need to pull this up. It's a free full text article, and take a look at this one. But here we go with skin temperature immediately immediately after cooling, okay? And we can see that the crushed ice is way down below where we're at for a, a gel pack, okay? Very, very, uh, you know, a whole lot of difference right there. Looking at frozen peas are better than a gel pack. Uh, but the gel packs, because they're convenient, that's probably the standard that's being used in clinics. Um, uh, but we probably should be using crushed ice. Okay, so just looking at this one right here. Um, it's safer to use. We can use crushed ice for upwards of an hour because, again, it's temperature. Uh, you know, it's, it's like I said, closer to uh, just at freezing, uh, whereas, um, you know, a gel pack is going to be uh, well below, uh, depending on the temperature of the machine that it comes out of. Okay, so uh, uh, from that same article, here's a, a rewarming curve. And we can see that the crushed ice is down here at the bottom. Because we had more of a temperature uh, decrease, it's going to be slower to warm up. So we get a longer lasting effect. Uh, and the gel pack is the one that's on top. Okay, so uh, seems a little counterintuitive counter that the gel pack is colder, but um, gives us um, uh, less of a, uh, the physiological effect that we, that we want. Um, and what that's being proposed that that's from is uh, that we have the phase change that, that occurs as the water uh, goes from uh, solid to a liquid. So it's able to extract more heat. And that's just that uh, nice property of that specific heat of the water, uh, again, coming to help us. 
Okay, so how do we go about doing this? You want to make sure you're uh, taking off jewelry and clothing. Again, jewelry for that uh, to, to reduce the effects of uh, conduction. Uh, I've listed here using a damp towel for maximum energy transfer. Okay, so if we were standing in a classroom, I'd be asking you why. All right, so this goes back to our insulation. Okay, so do we want to insulate someone from that cold when we use it? Okay. Uh, really, I mean, we're trying to get cold down to the skin. Why would we want to insulate that, right? So, uh, when we use a dry towel, we have air pockets. Okay. So, what's happening when we wet something is the is the water is taking up the space where the air would normally be. So, uh, since water is able to transmit that cold energy a little bit better than the air, going back to our rate of transmission slide back in the in part one. Okay, we have you know, a blocking of that heat transfer when we put an insulator on there and a dry towel is an insulator. Okay, so we want to use a damp towel so we, so, you know, if, if, if someone is, uh, you know, complaining of the cold, then put a damp towel on them. If not, if you're using ice, you can put that on the skin directly. If you're using a gel pack, you definitely want to use a, a damp towel because that gel pack is usually too cold to put on the skin and we can cause injury. Okay, so, uh, uh, and like we said before, we don't want to use ice uh, by itself, depending on our purpose, but we're going to elevate if possible, secure the ice pack, treat 10 to 30 minutes. If you're using um, crushed ice, you can even go upwards to an hour. And when the ice comes off, you want to look for any problems, any welts, <coughs> and uh, uh, re and uh, you know instruct your patient. They're able to repeat that every couple hours uh, for pain and or you know inflammation. Okay, so we're going to do some ice massage. And uh, pictured over here, I have a, a cup that you can buy. And uh, of course, you can always just use a, <coughs> a styrofoam cup um, and, you know, just peel away some of it. That's uh, uh, easy to use. Uh, these cups are convenient, makes a nice big block of ice, and you don't freeze your fingers doing that. So uh, they're nice to have as well. We have a couple of those in the lab. So treatment time is going to be in the five-minute range. You're going to keep your area nice and small. And uh, you can tell your patient what to expect. And they're going to have some intense cold. They're going to feel like it's burning. It's going to feel like it aches a little bit. And then it's going to go numb. Okay, so uh, uh, and what I'll usually do is tap on it with one finger, two fingers, and ask, uh, you know, if they feel one or two. And when they feel, when they can't tell the difference, that's when I know I've achieved the uh, level of uh, anesthesia that I've wanted. Okay, because a lot of times we're using uh, ice massage right before we're doing something a little more painful, uh, friction massage. Okay, so uh, nice technique, quick and easy, uh, works well. Okay, so uh, procedure for that. Again, jewelry, clothing, towels to catch any drips. It is a little bit messy. Gonna rub in the ice in small circles, uh, five or 10 minutes and inspect when you're done. So cold compression, uh, cryo cuffs, which we're gonna use in the lab, uh, game readies. They're really nice. They circulate the water and keep it at, uh, uh, at a common t constant temperature, but these things are they're they're blazing expensive, so um, uh, hard to justify, especially since you're not going to be doing little to no billing for your for your uh, cryotherapy sessions. So, uh, but there are a lot of them out there. Auto chill is another name for that. Okay, the nice thing about these is that they allow for both compression uh, and cold. So um, very nice to have uh, post injury. And some hospitals or some some uh, orthopedic surgeons they'll prescribe one of these after surgery and send it home with the patient. That's uh, kind of nice. Vapor coolant sprays. Okay, so we're going to, uh, later in the semester, we're going to be using uh, 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 trigger point dry needling, but we can achieve some of the same results, both with um, uh, cryotherapy, with using ice massage, as well as using some uh, vapor coolant spray. Um, and uh, 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 this was shown, uh, you know, a long time ago by Travell in the 80s that we're able to inactivate some of those trigger points uh, by using it. And uh, uh, the, the, the can of stuff that you're going to be looking for these days is this Gebauer's uh, Spray and Stretch. And it just comes in a small can. We will have those in the lab for you. Okay. So um, uh, new products. Uh, don't use any of the things that are supposed to be bad for the environment. And... Um, uh, I don't know that you can even get the other stuff. We had some fluoromethane here a couple years ago. We ran out of it. Um, it was, you know, even though you could not uh, obtain it anymore, it was 
It was still considered okay for medical purposes, but now they've replaced it with some other products here. So this pentafluoropropane or tetrafluoroethane, don't need to know those words, okay? <clears throat> so we'll just call it vapor coolant. Okay, cold whirlpool, uh, probably more used in our uh, athletic training clinics than you're gonna see in PT clinics. Um, it can work well for extremities. And, um, uh, you know, we start getting uh, down below 55, and it's going to be pretty darn uh, uncomfortable. Uh, so if you're going to be, you know, for longer immersion, uh, uh, you know, here's just a little scale, you know, showing showing down, you know, 55, going to be uncomfortable. 32 to 55 degrees, and that's more where we're going to be using this um, uh, for, for our cold treatments. Okay, it's going to kind of feel pretty darn cold. We're going to experience a little bit of that in lab as well. Okay, so the big problem with any whirlpool or, or, or you know, tubs is that dependent position. Uh, and, and so, you know, we're liable to cause more difficulty if we've got an uh, inflammatory process going on. Okay, when we're done with any of these treatments, we want to assess how effective we were. So different ways to do that. Look at a pain scale, check range of motion, uh, look at edema, uh, uh, you know, sensitivity to pressure with a pressure ergometer. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, whatever method you use, just make sure you reflect that you've had some treatment, you know, positive or negative effect. Documentation, document well enough so you can, so someone else can come along and repeat what you did. So where you treated it, what you used, how long you did it for, how they were positioned, and how they responded. Okay, so with that, it's time for us to head to lab. Uh, so depending on when you hear this, and we'll be, we'll be going to lab and experiencing uh, both heat and cold. All right, make sure you bring your, uh, bring your towels and uh, probably some sheets as well, and we'll see you in lab. Bye-bye.